Welcome to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast, where you go behind the scenes with financial planner, speaker, and consultant Michael Kitsis to hear stories of how leading financial advisors navigated the inevitable challenges that arise on the path to success and get insight from leading industry consultants about how to break through to the next level in your advisory business. And now here's your host, Michael Kitsis. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the 284th episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My guest on today's podcast is Andy Schwartz. Andy is a partner of Bleakley Financial Group, a hybrid advisory firm based in Fairfield, New Jersey, that broke away from a major insurance company and in just a few years nearly tripled its size to over $9 billion in assets across more than 50 advisors at the firm. What's unique about Andy, though, is how he and his partners have built their firm into a platform that gives advisors the opportunity to leverage centralized large firm support services from marketing to technology, compliance, and human resources, while still maintaining the freedom to run their own investment book of business, however they see fit for their clients. In this episode, we talk in depth about how Andy and his partners run their firm as a form of cooperative with advisors sharing resources and additional services to provide space and capacity to grow and scale their own practices, and even including such services as an in-house life coach for both their advisors and their clients. How Andy and his partners purposefully do not receive any compensation as equity owners and make a living purely from their own practices, P&L to instead be able to reinvest all the money generated by the firm back into the business to provide even more services their advisors can leverage. And how Andy attracts new top talent by not only trying to offer capacity and scale that's aligned to their advisors, but doing so while supporting a wide breadth of RA custodians to give their advisors flexibility. We also talk about how Andy accidentally started his financial services career in college by selling insurance to college seniors after looking for a way to pay for his own education. How after working in a large insurance broker dealer for over 30 years and becoming frustrated with corporate constraints, Andy made the difficult decision to walk away with this $3 billion practice and start his own firm. And how Andy approaches his leadership of the firm by viewing himself as a player and a coach rather than simply as an executive, as he maintains his own practice within Bleakly to show solidarity and create alignment with the other advisors of the firm by eating his own cooking. And be certain to listen to the end, where Andy shares how despite working hard for more than three decades to build an advisory firm and reach $9 billion of AUM, he's still a little surprised at just how far it's grown over the years. How Andy has taken the approach that the moments when things go wrong can be viewed as learning and growth opportunities to better himself and lessen the regrets he has in his own life. And why Andy believes it's the combination of building credibility and our own financial resources that's the key to position ourselves to truly make an impact as an advisor. And so with that introduction, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Financial Advisor Success Podcast with Andy Schwartz. Welcome, Andy Schwartz, to the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. Thanks. Uh, great to be here. Big fan. So very excited to have a chance to talk to you. Well, thank you. Likewise, I'm, I'm looking forward to the conversation today and just some of the, I guess, the the journey that you've had through the through the industry, you know, I, I find for most advisors in our careers, there, there's kind of this process of, you know, sometimes like we, some of us bounce around a bit in the first, in the first couple of years, just trying to find like the right firm, the right platform, the right home. Every now and then we land it right the first time. But most advisors I find actually like we, we make one or two changes in the first couple of years. And then eventually kind of you, you find the place that you're going to stay for a while and you might stay there for, for 10 plus years. And then often I actually find there's sort of this I don't know, like 10 to 15 year itch thing that happens where a lot of advisors and they get to a certain stage of maturity is like, okay, I'm kind of thinking about like where I want to be for the rest of my career, like the next 20 plus years to come. And and we make one more change. And that, that tends to be where we, where we kind of live out our journey from there. And I know you just, you had a little bit of a different path. You, you spent more than 30 years from like straight out of college with one particular large firm institution, was there all the way through, decided to make a change a couple of years ago, grew like 3x the size in a couple of years that you did in the first 30, which is sort of a fascinating transition unto itself. And so I'm, I'm, I think I'm just excited to kind of talk about these, like these journeys that we take of deciding what what sorts of firms or platforms we're going to be affiliated with, and and when and how you get to the the moment or the decision. I think including especially when you've been at one firm as as long as you spent time at one firm to say like I've st- like I've been really happy and comfortable here, but I got to make a change for the next stage. Yeah. Like what what gets to the point after 30 years to say I don't know if it's the right fit anymore. 
Yeah, I think for for us and and again, I wasn't alone. I have uh, at the time I had three partners. Today I have four partners. Um, so we've always had a firm, and even uh, when we were part of uh, our old institution, uh, we were uh, I guess a district office. But you know, we always operated as a firm, and our whole philosophy was always that we wanted to be the best that we could be in our marketplace, and that we did not want to have to say no to clients. And if clients said can you do this? We wanted to be able to say, and obviously within reason, but we always wanted to say, yes, we can do that for you. And what we found was that the institution we were with was awesome. I wouldn't trade my experience over the first 30 years for anything. It was great culture, great people, a lot of learning. So no regrets, certainly. But we just got to a point where we wanted to do more things and we just weren't quite fitting in to the box. And I think anytime you work for a large company, no matter whether it's a wirehouse or whether it's an insurance-based company, you know, th- there always are going to be limitations because they have, you know, they have issues, right? I mean, they're trying to sort of corral all of these people, you know, into some kind of a manageable box. And so I think what sometimes ends up happening is they, they build their resources, they make their investments, they spend their time and energy. And I don't want to say at the lowest common denominator level, but certainly not at the highest common denominator level, right? Because it's just not a, a smart way probably to run a business. And so we just got to a point where there were things that we wanted to do, you know, including, you know, being multi-custodial. And so we made the decision. We thought it would be best for our clients and best for our future growth, you know, to make a move. And we did it. It was a little scary for sure. I'm not going to, and it was painful. My goodness, it was painful, but I'm, I'm thrilled that we did it. So I, I definitely do want to kind of come back to you know the the scary and the pain at the point you actually decide you're you're going to make a transition. But I think first, just help fill us in a little bit more on on just what this career looked like historically. So what was the firm that you were building at, and sure. what what did it look like in the I guess you know the the first decade or few that you were that you were there building in that environment? It's it's, a, it's I'm glad you asked because I really wanted to go there right because I always like to say that the best place to start is in the beginning. So I sold life insurance my senior year in college. I'm in this industry like probably a lot of the people listening to us today completely by accident. I wasn't an insurance major and I certainly wasn't an investment major. I was you know, a marketing guy at Glasgow State College and I was really there for two reasons, pretty poor SAT scores and I didn't have any money. So it was an hour from home and it was something that my brother Scott and I were twins. We could pay for school while we waited tables or Scott worked at a men's clothing store at the mall. So we were able to kind of pay for our stuff and go to school. And so my senior year, I had a a falling out with the guy I was working for in a restaurant and my ex-wife actually lived with an insurance guy, you know, a guy that was had an office. If you can believe this, they sold life insurance to college seniors on notes. Yeah, fidelity in life. I'm not even sure if they're still in business. So they were like selling like mini whole life policies. Exactly. To seniors. You got it. They were selling what they called the college plan. It was a fifty thousand dollar whole life policy. And and actually halfway through they became universal life. So it was right when universal life hit the, the scene. And you would basically take a ten dollar money order because these people didn't even have checkbooks. And you would basically they would sign a note. And then when they graduate from college, you would start to pay their premium. The crazy thing was though, is that they would pay me like eight hundred dollars for every one of these policies I sold. And so I come home, I, I say, oh, I've got to go back to start waiting tables at ground round. I'm a little pissy about it. And Steve, you know, the guy that she lived with and who was my friend, who was the general agent for Fidelity, I said, why don't you come sell life insurance with me? And this is like July uh, 1983, going into my senior year. So I thought about it and I said, well, I know pretty much everybody on campus. It was interesting. And so I'm sitting in August and taking, looking at a, studying for my insurance exam. I took my insurance exam late August and I become a Fidelity life, life insurance agent. And I do really well. You know, I, I make an awful lot of money in 1983, 84. And so- I, mean, I, I was just going to yeah, think please. about that. So like, so the the commission at the time was eight eight $800 on a policy. Yeah. I mean, I was- um, that, I mean, that feels like a lot of money in the early well, 1980s. And, it actually, and, it, it, and, and actually, it might've been a little bit less, but I was making like three to $4,000 a month, you know, uh, in commissions. So it was kind of crazy. And this is 1983, 1984. So yeah, I mean that's you, like that's that's good. I mean, that's I probably could supported could probably supported a family of three or four, I guess, at the time. But so 
and, and then what happens is my brother Scott is working at John Wanamaker's, which is sort of like a Lord and Taylor, you know, mid range department store in Deptford, New Jersey. We're outside of Philadelphia and he's selling suits on commission. And my brother made $40,000 his senior year selling clothes 20 hours a week in John Wanamaker's, you know, the men's department. So we, you know, we were working and making money. And so I guess in April, my brother gets a job interview with what was the nucleus of our firm. It had been, it was brand new. So he comes up and, you know, he calls me from the turnpike from a payphone because there are no cell phones. He's all excited. We're going to be rich and it's going to be great. I've, I think that I am, I've, I think I found the Holy Grail. I mean, I grew up in Williamburg, New Jersey. That doesn't mean anything to you, but, you know, I was making more money in my senior year in college than probably most of the parents, you know, that, you know, that I was friends with, you know, it was a very lower middle-class town and I thought, wow, I'm, you know, I'm going to be rich. I'm going to make a hundred thousand dollars someday, you know, selling insurance down there. And so I went up. And then hundred K was a big number in, in the, in the eighties. And I tell you, I would have made probably a hundred thousand dollars my first year out of college there because they hand you a box full of orphan policyholders. And at the time it was when whole life was converted to universal life. So the pitch was really difficult. You'd say to the client, if you pay the same premium, you'll have three times more cash value when you're 65. Would you like to do that? And they, and they were willing to swap these policies, these insurance companies, which I can't understand that how they could do that, but they did it and paid you for it. But I went up to Northern New Jersey and I met with what was the nucleus of the firm at the time, uh, the original partners who were all gone at this point and have been for quite a long time. And so you can imagine my brother is a very, very attractive prospect, you know? And so the three or four or five of us are at lunch. And all of a sudden I start talking about how I trial close college seniors for life insurance. And it was kind of funny, like all of a sudden, everybody turns their chairs, my poor brother, you know, <laughs> their backs and they're all like circling around me, you know, because, you know, I guess for them, it was kind of a fascinating, you know, situation. It's like the, the guy selling suits was one thing, but the guy who's actually selling insurance, like we got to talk to this one. <laughs> yeah. So I realized after talking to these guys and they were involved, they were talking about planning, they were talking about investments and so investments in was mutual funds, you know, A shares, whatever. They weren't doing very much of anything. I mean, the senior partner that year probably made 28000 thousand dollars. I mean, he was living in a, in a house with three other guys. You know, it wasn't like they were super uh, successful, but they were very smart and they had a really good vision. And so upon graduation, you know, we both moved up to Northern New Jersey and we started with the firm. So at that time there was one assistant, there were probably, I don't know, seven or eight agents and that was the business, you know, and, um, and then what had happened was over time, you know, we started to, you know, grow the business and we started to share with each other, you know, staff, you know, to build out, you know, we wanted to be doing planning. We got our CFPs right away. And, and I would say it probably took me 10 years to get to, you know, a zero net worth probably. You know, I always used to talk to people and I've done a lot of speaking over the years in the Northwestern system particularly. And I would always say that it, it's never about uh, expenses. It's, only, it's really about revenue. And so our philosophy always was just to keep hiring, you know, really high quality people keep improving, you know, sort of the product that we're out there with and not the insurance product, but the planning product. And we did that. And, and I was able to share those expenses with, you know, my three partners. And so therefore, you know, we could grow faster. And then everybody's businesses just kept growing, you know, so, and then ultimately we become, you know, the, the biggest, uh, you know, office within the system on the investment side. And I had, you know, the biggest investment practice. Um, and then now, you know, we're, I guess, about $9 billion in assets. And, you know, financially, I never imagined imagined, you know, that, um, that I would be in the situation I'm in. How did you grow and get going in the early years? Like, sure. What, what did the first, what did that first 10 years yeah, just, look it's, like? It's n nothing but activity. You know, um, I didn't have a particular market. I was 22 years old. I didn't know anybody in Northern New Jersey. We didn't come from any money, so we had no financial contacts. So basically, like I think any good young, either insurance agent or good advisor would do to build a practice, it was basically activity. You know, I made tons of phone calls, got referrals from everybody I could, you know, always asked for referrals, always networked, always paid attention and worked really crazy hours, worked weekends, worked evenings, you know, worked a lot, you know, and slowly, you know, it started to, 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 to work. And, you know, it, I, I, the great thing about this business is if you're willing to put in the time, everybody, I believe can be very, very successful. You just have to be willing to do the work.
And, you know, and I, and uh, something I heard a long time ago is that successful advisors are just really willing to do things that maybe unsuccessful advisors aren't willing to do. And I think that's really about the work. And so it wasn't, I didn't come up with a great idea. I wasn't particularly smart, just really put in the time in client build and just built lots and lots of clients. I sold 450 life insurance policies my fourth year in the business, which is a lot of life insurance policies. So you how know, many? 450 life insurance policies. In a year. In a year, yeah, yeah. My fourth year in the business, yeah. That's more than a policy every day of the year. Like right, you're, yeah, right. You're right, doing but, a delivery every day of the every day of the year. I mean, I'm assuming some of that's you know, there's a family, you get to absolutely. deliver more, more than one yeah, at a time. Yeah, but. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, it, it was a life insurance policy on someone and a disability policy, and maybe a life insurance policy on the, on the spouse, and you know, maybe in the kids. I mean, it was you know, but but that was the the thought process. I couldn't control the quality of the people that I saw a meeting. I I couldn't control what I got in front of rich people or not, people that had any money, but I could control if I got in front of people, right? Because that's just a matter of work. And so, you know, a lot of small stuff, you know, wasn't making a huge amount of money, although I was making a lot more money than all my friends were. And then what ends up happening is, you know, success begets success. You start to see better people and better people and better people. And if you have those habits, you take that 400 uh, policy in a year and all of a sudden you graduate to professional su successful people. And then all of a sudden you really start to make money. And that was the process. So it's always been really about just activity, working really hard, building a big client base. And now we, you know, I, I'm basically able to harvest that, you know, that that client base I built. Like I think, I think the 24 year old all the time because it was really hard and I wasn't making any money and it was really difficult and discouraging at times. And, but for whatever reason, you know, I, I really believed that if I continued to do that, you know, it would work out and it did, you know, it did. So I, I guess this helped fill us in a little bit more. Like just what was the activity? I mean, what do you, what are you actually doing yeah. to write 450 policies Four, four years in as a, I guess, like 20, 26, 27 yeah, yeah. year old by so that it, time. Yeah. At the time, I was basically in the medical market. So I was working with physicians and I was working with residents. So I had about five or six different hospitals that I sort of staked out. And what I would do in the morning is I'd go in early around 7, 7.30, and I'd have a, a, a stack of yellow cards for each individual hospital that I worked at. And these were referrals that I'd gotten from other residents. And so I would start calling the first person that would agree to see me that day. You know, and it was classic, you know, stop by and introduce myself, you know, have a cup of coffee, spend five minutes. And then if I right, got it. Right, I mean, were, were you actually already there? Oh, or? no, no, no. I was in my office in Fairfield. And okay. then and then I would make my calls and then I would set up my day. And then once I got to the hospital, if I maybe only had two or three appointments, I would get on the house phone, you know, at the hospital. Uh, and then I would start paging you know, while I was there. Some days I get lucky, you know, and I would bump into four or five or six people. And some days, you know, I'd go drive somewhere and I might see one person or nobody. But you just, you know, it's a, it's a numbers game. And then, you know, the more you're around, the more people that you sell, they introduce you to their friends. I could hang out in the on-call rooms, you know. Um, so I, I spent a lot of time and got to know these people. And then what started happening you know, because so it's just we, like a little mini niche with a couple of your local hospitals where exactly. you just got known as the 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 go to guy exactly. at the hospital. Exactly. No different than if you're staked out at some, you know, uh, some company, you know, and I'm sure lots of people work with professionals in certain companies, same idea. You know, they instead of being staked out at Nabisco or or, you know, GE, I'm staked out at a number of hospitals talking to you know, a bunch of residents. But the, but the reason we did that was we knew that residents become doctors. And in the 80s, and even in the 90s, that was a time where they came out and they were business owners. And we knew that business owners would be our best clients because they not only would buy life insurance or disability insurance, we'd set up pensions. So we, there were lots of things we could do with them, you know, to create what we would always describe as multiple, you know, streams of revenue, you know, really maximize, you know, the efficiency and the profitability of a client. And then from there, that took us into the rest of the world. So that, but that's really kind of how it started. And that sort of was what the day was like. And I would drive an hour, you know, to, to meet somebody that, you know, might or might not open their front door, but you know, it was just a numbers game. So out of curiosity, like, do you, do you think of that as still being like representative and feasible for the business yeah. now? Like, do you yeah. think that that kind of thing would work or was that sort of a function of yeah, what it what it looked like at the time, but you can't you can't hang out at a hospital and call on people. Yeah, and I and yeah, and I appreciate the thought. I mean, security is different. People don't take phone calls, so it is different. And I would say that 
probably in a hospital setting, uh, probably not. Although, you know, I don't know. I guess it just depends on where. But I think the idea is it probably has to be done a little differently today just because of, you know, the way the world is today. But I would say, though, that the thought should be the same. If you're a young advisor and if you want to build a big practice, and I guess, you know, I don't have the biggest practice in America, but I've got a big practice. And, and I'm just a regular guy. You know, I'm not a – I'm no genius. So the reality is, is that if you're willing to put in the time, make the phone calls, be consistent. The biggest problem that most people have is they're not consistent. So they'll have a really big week, a really big month where they really are busy and, and focused. And then I guess maybe they get paid and then they're not so nervous. They're not so fearful. And then they slow down. And so for me, the key was to be consistent. And so whether that sort of uh, uh, process is possible today or not, I can't, I'm not really sure. It's certainly not my process. You know, I, now people call me and I talk to them and, you know, and we, and they basically agree to give us their money almost up front because the referral was so strong. And, you know, and I pinch myself when I get off the phone because it's, you know, I can't believe that this is what's really happening. But I do believe though, that it's really about activity. It's about being uh, intentional. It's about getting referrals. It's about, you know, calling on, you know, people and, and working really hard at it and building a client base. And then from there, you can leverage into almost anything you want to do. So I do think that part of it, it's still about work. It's still about hard work. It's still about, you know, making calls and, and putting yourself out there. So out of curiosity, then in, I guess in in that in a kind of thread and and pathway, you you had this momentum on the insurance end. You you noted that ultimately you ended out much more heavily on the investment side over time. So like when did that shift start to happen? Yeah, early. And I was fortunate that one of my partners who hasn't been, uh, you know, he's left the firm years ago, but he was a really smart guy and he liked the investment business. And so he gravitated to that business. What I gravitated to was the idea that I loved the insurance business. You know, I kind of liked the idea that we were helping people, you know, and that what we were doing actually mattered. You know, if I sold a thousand copiers, and I don't know what they pay you to sell a copier in the 80s, but I imagine I would have made pretty good money. But Probably. not, yeah, but not, a, but not a huge social impact, you know, not, not the guy that delivered the check, not maybe the most important, you know, person that someone unfortunately ever met because maybe they died or became disabled and we were the people that actually, you know, protected their families. And so, you know, to me, I love that aspect of the business. But, but what I didn't like was I didn't like the idea that I had to go out every year on January 1st and do it again. You know, mm. and it was all about how many things do you sell? I, I really wanted to get away from, because I, I knew that I, I could make a really good living and I, you know, I could make a million dollars a year, you know, my 10th year in the business and that was fine. But, you know, you live in Northern New Jersey, you pay taxes and whatever. It's not like, you know, you're not super rich. And I didn't see how that was going to become, I didn't see how I was going to grow that by multiples. But the investment business and the idea that, you know, you get into a fee-based, you know, advisory kind of an investment business, which we did almost, you know, right away. And I saw that if I could go out and collect $10 million, then $20 million, and $30 million, and $50 million, the compounding impact on that was a long-term sustainable growth business. And that was very attractive to me. And so I tried really hard to make that pivot, you know, as quickly as possible. So when in practice did that pivot start coming up for you? I mean, just are like, are we still in the 80s? Are we in the 90s? Are we into the 2000s? Yeah, I mean, I, I unfortunately, because I mentioned I, you know, I wasn't as smart as I, I would like to be. So it probably took me about 15 years to really get focused on the asset collection business. You know, so we we probably should have started a little bit earlier. And part of that was because of the environment we were in and, you know, what was appreciated and what was honored was more on the premium side than it was on the investment side, the tools that were offered and created. You know, we really had to build this thing out ourselves at that time. Now, obviously, they built out tremendous capabilities for these people. I mean, they're, they're very, very serious, you know, competitors in the, in the investment business today. But at that time, they really weren't. But I would say about 15 years in, we really started to focus, hired people. We've made some great hires over the years. We have wonderful people that work within our firm. And, you know, we, and we started investing in that side of the business. And that's when we really started getting traction. So I'm just thinking kind of timing overall, 15-ish years, like we're, we're basically into the late 1990s where, you know, again, like mar markets are booming. There's a lot more investment focus and discussion than there was before, a, a lot more public interest and desire towards investing. So what did it look like 
I guess, initially, as you began to make that transition, I mean, were there advisory and fee-based account options for you? Was this mostly going into the mutual fund business and just starting to build A share or C share portfolios? Like, what what were you actually building as you started trying to get it going? Yes, yeah, so I would say that at that at that time, we were we were doing what we called fee and lieu accounts. You know, by the say mid to late nineties, so they weren't technically advisory accounts, but you were charging a fee in lieu of commissions. And do you remember the Merrill Lynch rule and all that yep. stuff that happened? Yeah, and then so it was before the Merrill Lynch rule where they sort of kibosh that. So it would be C shares on the smaller accounts, and it would be sort of this fee and lieu. So it was the precursor to what we think of as advisory accounts. Today, smaller though, you know, then a good file could have been five hundred thousand dollars. You know, I mean, I was happy to take a physician out of practice and start up a profit sharing plan. You know, and and start out with a you know fifty thousand dollar deposit. You know, anything that could be a new client that we could grow. You know, I was very excited. You know, to do, and then eventually, I guess it probably took another ten years before we were truly you know advisory. You know, and then in 2015, we we truly went independent advisory on multi platforms when we took the firm, uh, you know, outside and went independent. So, what was it like building this in the context of an insurance company? Because the end yeah. of the day, like you're you're anchored to Northwestern. I know. Yeah. I mean, most of the major insurers through the 80s and 90s all built out insurance broker dealer divisions, anyways, because they needed it in order to do the variable annuities and yep, variable yep. universal life that was becoming sure. becoming popular. So, like, there were you know there were there were BD options at virtually all of these platforms, but yep. our RIA and hybrid was almost non-existent, and for a lot of them, they were still like they were insurance companies with the B, with the BD options like what what was it yeah. what was it like trying to build more in the investment direction while sure. you're while you're still doing this in the context of insurance company well probably would have been almost impossible by myself so again this is where i was so fortunate to have partners because since we were in an environment at that time and again things have changed dramatically since then but at that time there wasn't a lot of investment being made you know by the institution so we were basically building out you know our own sort of investment process if you will hiring people that understood you know how to do this stuff both from an administrative standpoint and from a proposal standpoint where we hired a great guy from Alliance Bernstein we could hand him statements and a fact finder he would come back you know with a review of what the clients were currently doing in say their Merrill Lynch accounts or wherever they were and then make a proposal and and build that proposal around planning so it was a retirement analysis and it could have been an estate analysis and it would have been insurance included but also uh, to grab and gather those assets. So you start going further down this investment road, I guess, in, into the 2000s and I, I guess gaining more momentum. Now, I, I know ultimately you were in an environment where there were sort of like a, a lot of advisors affiliated with you or, or, or associated with you in addition to your own client practice. So was there like, was there some point where this transition from like Andy is building Andy's clients and gathering more clients in an, in an asset center management model to like, we're building a firm of advisors yeah. and there's lots yeah. of advisors affiliated. Like when, yeah. when did yeah. that transition start to happen? Yeah, I would say that it probably it started in earnest in 2015 when we made the change. My role changed quite a bit, but I would say that my partners and myself always sort of delegated, you know, different responsibilities. We always sort of had two businesses. You know, we had the firm and we had, you know, our individual practices. But I would say in the last, since 2015, but really probably in the last three years or so, I mean, we went from three administrative professionals. You know, we, we, we left uh, and went independent with a COO, basically a C, uh, I guess like a controller and, you know, one other administrative person that was sort of responsible to help us run the firm. Today, we have like 16 people, you know, we have 16 offices. So I kind of think of myself as a player coach now, because I really do have two jobs. I run my practice with a great team. So, and we have a little less than $2 billion under management. So it's, it's obviously a, a large practice, but I do have a fantastic uh, team that I work with and I love, and they've been with me a long time and they're awesome. And so I clearly could not do that without them. And a day doesn't go by where I'm not talking to somebody. And that includes Saturdays and Sundays and evenings. So, but the difference, I guess, for me is, is that, and I, and I talk about, you know, because we interview a lot of advisors, we're in the growth mode, we'll onboard probably, 
you know, eight or 10, well, maybe eight advisors this year. And I tell people that there's three differences or there's three things that we think about at Bleakly that might be different. We think it's about alignment, capacity, and scale. And we really run the firm like a co-op. So I don't make any money. Uh, and maybe I should admit this because maybe people think I'm not very smart, but I don't really make any money as an, an equity owner of Bleakley Financial Group, even though we have this big practice and generate lots of money because we, we reinvest all the money that we generate as a firm back into the business. So we're just growing, growing, growing the business. But what, what I tell advisors and why I think they should be with us is we are perfectly aligned. The owners of the firm make their living the same way the advisor does. So in the morning, if I come in and Zoom calls aren't, you know, the Zoom isn't working because we're having a problem with our server, you know, at LPL or wherever this stuff is being generated, I've got the same frustration that they have. Or if there's something wrong with commissions or if there's something wrong with the Orion software or whatever it is, if they go out into the marketplace and somebody, you know, embarrasses them because something isn't good, well, I'm, I'm experiencing the same thing. And so we are all perfectly aligned. So we are all spending our resources, our time and our energy. We're all sort of marching the same way. We're all marching in the same direction with the same goal. The capacity is that if you can get a bunch of people together then and you can share those resources, think about what you can build. So, I mean, I have a life coach here, you know, full time. She's awesome. So she talks to teams. She does assessments for all new hires, but she also talks to clients and talk about wanting to make a lasting impression or to create a really long-term relationship with a client, you know, provide good planning and provide good service, but help them, you know, with a, a crisis when they, when they really need help, either them or their children and, and do it for free because we don't charge for that. That's really you know, different, you know, that so this is a life coach that's on staff with the advisory correct. firm. That's correct. She, and, she. and I guess, and, and working with both advisors themselves and with clients. Right. And, and really mostly with advisors, teams and the clients. Now she'll work with the advisors too. And several advisors take advantage of that, but it's, it's, it's really the teams. I mean, we find that advisors, especially if they're really successful, they're typically not very good managers. You know, they, they're not necessarily very good communicators. And so there's a lot of dysfunction amongst teams. And so what she helps do is she helps us or she helps them get rid of all that dysfunction. And, and by the way, at the firm level as well, because there's plenty of dysfunction or was plenty of dysfunction when she got here, just at a, in a partner's meeting. It's amazing to just a partner's meeting today and a partner's meeting, say, five years ago. But yeah, so and that's just one example of a resource. They don't pay for it. It just, she's here, use her or, not, or don't use her. Same thing with marketing. I mean, my CIO is Peter Bookvar. And I don't know if you ever heard of Peter Bookvar or not, but you know, Peter Bookvar has been a CBC contributor for 20 years. He's a really, really smart, well thought of, you know, individual, but you know, he's on once or twice a week, really brilliant. He sits in our office in front of his Bloomberg terminal. He is just a wealth of information and knowledge and, and help. And he, does you know client uh, meetings uh, builds he runs two portfolios for us and again it doesn't cost my guys anything you know to have you know that resource in our office every day so the idea is just being being large enough that you have the capacity to add these exactly scale. these unique specialized positions or support offerings exactly i mean together if you have if you do 60 million dollars in revenue and you know you can generate whatever that you know whatever the firm keeps in an override if you can reinvest that override so millions and millions and millions of dollars are being reinvested where everybody would want it to be invested so if i were if i were a ceo or proper ceo and i basically made my living growing our firm and managing our firm well, a lot of the money that I re, that we reinvest as partners into the business would be taken out as you know dividends or income or profit, which is fine, right? That's how people make their living. But since we make our living running our own P and Ls, that money can be reinvested into the business. And so that I don't, I'm sure that doesn't make us unique, but I think it definitely makes us different. And that's really you know how we view this thing. We view this as a co-op. You know, we're right now we're 55, 54 ish advisors you know, on our way to 60 uh, this year and all kind of working together and sharing resources. So help us understand a little bit more, like what you're, you're growing under the Northwestern umbrella. Yep. I guess so like how, how big did it get by the time you were getting into, I guess, 2014 before you made a transition? Like what did it look, what did it look like at that point? So we were, we were 30 advisors and, you know, and some younger advisors at the time, we were willing to hire younger kids because you could 
you know, hire somebody out of school or a couple of years out and, you know, they could sell insurance policies and make a living. And that was okay. We don't do that anymore because it's impossible. That's not the business we're in. And, you know, we're, we're hiring, you know, successful advisors that want to grow their businesses, not start a business. So we had one office, you know, in Fairfield, New Jersey. We had a very small, you know, management team. You know, we really had at that time before we decided to make the move, we had really one sort of controller kind of guy. And we had a, a part-time CFO, you know, partners kind of whacked up you know, responsibilities. And, you know, we really weren't growing a lot. It wasn't, uh, we didn't have a recruiter. We didn't really have the time. And so at that point, I would say that we were sort of cooperating and sharing, you know, resources and just trying to improve the product offering, you know, the planning offering that we had together by pooling our resources, you know, making a little bit of money as, as a partner, as a distribution. But again, our own P&Ls were how we were supporting ourselves. And, you know, it was fine. And we were three billion in assets at that time. And that was good. You know, I mean, at the time that we made the move out, we were probably, I'm sure we weren't the biggest deal, but every major institution was all over us. You know, everybody was in my conference room and it was flattering because I just figured, you know, we never paid attention to what's going on out in the world. And so I'm thinking, you know, are we big? Are we small? I don't even know. But apparently we were bigger than we thought because, you know, everybody wanted to make a deal with us. So I want to come back to that in a moment. Sure, but I, sure. I just want to understand the, the structure. So uh, perhaps my own ignorance, but I, I, I thought the structure under Northwestern, like, I guess like most uh, insurance companies and the insurance BDs is kind of like all the advisors have their own practices. And I mean, they may have a, you're like some, some support staff or maybe a, a, a team member or two, but not like a 30 advisor. Yeah. Sort of so roll, yeah. roll it up structure. So the, yeah. So the, yeah, the way these, the way their, their operations worked was you had district offices and then you had like, you know, managing offices. So maybe you had uh, some of the, the big office in say New York city and, and that person might have four or five or six smaller offices under their auspice. So we were the smaller office under the auspice of, say, the North Jersey managing partner, if you will, but our smaller office was bigger than the main office. You know, it was much bigger. And they basically, my partner, one of my partners was the named, you know, manager, if you will. I think that's probably more what people are uh, common. Okay. We, we, call so, it a, we call it a district agent, but a manager. And then what we had was we had our own agreement. You know, we had a, a partnership agreement that the district agency actually belonged to the four partners, not to the manager, if you will. And since the leases were, were in our name and everything was in our name, you know, we were kind of in control. So, and we ran our, our BD, if you will, you know, was Northwestern Mutual. We ran our business through Northwestern. Okay. So functionally, you had you had kind of created this environment where you, I guess like you try to think through the structures, like you had a partnership structure whose role was to manage the district agency. And then the district agency had, you know, 30 odd advisors that were that were that were rolled up under it that I guess you, know, you got to hire, recruit, train, you know, work 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 with under your under your local umbrella, presuming exactly. all all local, like they were all yeah, everything, area because yeah, this was yeah. regionally based. Absolutely. Everybody was local. Everybody, you know, came into the office. And this is obviously way before people were, you know, hybrid work environments. So everybody lived here, worked here. And, and and we were early adapters to that. But I would say today I'm sure there's more of that going on within their system. And and look, to their credit, they tolerated it. Because I don't think anyone ever really liked it. But they they my the the guy that ran New Jersey. Jersey, who we sort of were under, he was an awesome uh, man. And he basically got out of the way. He said, do what you want to do, you know, run a good business and I'll let you, I'll support you any way you want to do it. So, yeah. So, so you're at 30 advisors and increasingly investment focus. So what, what was the asset base at that point? So in 2015, we were 3 billion in assets, you know, when we made the move. Wow. So I mean, that's a, that's a big number. I mean, even for even for kind of rolling up 30 yeah. advisors under it. Like that, that's a lot. That's a yeah. lot of advisory assets, particularly in a in insurance broker dealer environment. Yeah. Well, yeah, we were the biggest office uh, when we left. So now what what leads you to ultimately say, like, I've been here for 30 years. It's been a good run. I mean, we we got to grow up to three billion. They've allowed us some flexibility to have kind of this partnership structure running our district agency. Why change and and yeah. you know, mess mess with that and introduce yeah. all this hassle and stress into your life. Like what 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 led you to say we got to change this? I think part of the problem might be because I went into the business when I was 22 years old. So I've never really worked for anyone, right? I've always been a basically a straight commission person. And anybody that works for a large institution today, you know, whether it's a Northwestern Mutual or whether it's a 
Bank of America, Merrill Lynch or, or Goldman Sachs, it doesn't matter who it is. Everything has gotten very, very corporate. And we just got to a, a point and they're, listen, awesome, awesome company. Some of the greatest advisors that I've ever met are advisors there. I mean, just quality, caring, smart, you know, successful. I mean, really just a high quality group. I used to look forward to meetings just because I could be around these people. And so great, you know, great uh, sales force, if you will. But what happens is I just found myself constantly fighting to do something, to do things I wanted to do that just did not seem to be things that, that everybody shouldn't be able to do. And sometimes they would make an exception for me, but not for my partners. And it, it was just, it got to a point where I was just exhausted and I was, 50, you know, 50 years old and, or 53 years old. And I was too old to fight anymore. And, you know, we, we, I had friends outside that were, you know, that were in the business. And I just thought, you know, if we're ever going to do this, we better, we better do it now. And so, you know, it was a little, a little late, but better late than ever. Can you give me, I guess, just some examples, like what, just like, what were the things you were trying to do that they wouldn't let you do that just, you know, yeah, I mean, so, look, so rubbed you the wrong way. You're like, I'm yeah, going to so lock my $3 billion out the door. Yeah. So, I mean, look, my guess is, is that some of the things that I couldn't do then, they probably even can do now. So, I would say that at the time, there were issues around 401k plans and what could be advisory. It's the same thing that everyone's listening to me today has, you know, where there's something that they want, they need an exception, you know, whether it's a minimum being able to reduce a fee and you basically eat the, the, the discount, you know, not having the, and again, all of these things could have been remedied. I don't know. I don't pay attention. It doesn't really matter, but it's, but it's just the idea that you cannot, you, you take all the risk, you do all the work, you know, we, we hire our own people, we do everything ourselves, but then somebody else tells you what you can or cannot do. And that just gets old after a while. And so we just kind of felt like we just wanted a little bit more uh, control over, you know, the quality. I could not have Peter Bookvar in my office in that arrangement running two portfolios for our clients. I have the healthcare guy, David Mandelbaum, who is a rock star. David ran healthcare for one of the larger, you know, uh, most prominent hedge funds in the country for 15 years. That hedge fund went to a family office because the founder retired and he happened to be a client of our firms. And now he runs a healthcare portfolio for me and he's another resource in my firm and a really, really great guy to get on the phone with a client. And so again, I I can't, I could not do things like that, you know, in that environment. And that, and that, you know, it doesn't make them bad. It doesn't, it just, it's just complicated. It just made life too complicated. Yeah. It's a phenomenon. I feel like I've watched play out in a, a lot of the large firm environments over, I guess, particularly the past 10 years. So it's been there to some extent for a long time that, you know, in theory, like one of the things that should scale really well in a large firm environment is compliance. Like compliance obligations are fairly fixed and, and often repeatable processes. Like if you get to be a big firm, you should be able to create a lot of economies of scale to do compliance really efficiently. But in practice, what seems to happen is like the the larger the firm gets, the more advisors there are under the there are under the umbrella that could potentially do something wrong and like break a rule. And if you're if you're a chief compliance officer and the reality is like regulators are going to take your swing at your firm based on like whatever the whatever the biggest nut Knucklehead and the whole firm can manage to do and fly under the radar and get away with so that only a regulator catches it and then comes in and punishes you for failure to supervise. Your like you just your natural course of action is as a chief compliance officer, like you make the most stringent rule possible to prevent like the one biggest idiot in the entire organization from getting you sued or fined by a regulator. And for everybody else in the firm who's actually just like a normal, good, competent, high quality advisor, your compliance processes end up being dragged down to the lowest common denominator. And the bigger the firm and the wider they recruit, like the better the odds they have one knucklehead somewhere in there that makes a really annoying compliance process that everybody else has to follow. And there, there just seems to be this weird anti-scaling effect that's really cropped up in large firms in the past decade that you know everybody gets dragged down the lowest common denominator. 100%. The, the bigger the firm, the bigger the gap between the lowest common denominator and the average advisor. Yep. <laughs> it just creates more, more frustration if you're trying to do anything that's the, the smallest bit creative or outside the absolute standard lines that the lowest common denominator fits in. It's, it's exactly right. So what ends up happening is once you become an outlier, you know, then it's, then it's a problem. And really, we just became an outlier. When you're, when you're always asking for that exception, and, and look, I get it. You run a big company. There's 10,000 
people out there and only six or 10 or 12 people want this, why bother? You know, it's not where you're going to, you know, spend your resources and we don't want to have to worry about it. And these places, and I'm not saying Northwestern, I'm saying all of these big institutions today. I mean, they're run by, you know, a lot of lawyers and accountants and, and I get it. I, I respect, you know, I mean, they're, they're doing, they're doing their job. It's kind of exactly. how you got to play the game the exactly. way the rules are written right it's exactly, now. It's exactly right. I don't criticize them for it. And yeah, and I wasn't, I wasn't mad at them. I thought they were awesome. You know, it was just, and I hope they weren't mad at us. It just got to a point where it just didn't work, you know, anymore. And I think everybody, you know, should um, understand that if someone were to leave me because it just wasn't the best place for them to be the best advisor they could be or build the best business they could build, I wouldn't be mad at them. Why, why, how could I be mad at them? You know, everybody should be able to make that decision. So, but yeah, it's a, but that's all. And it's, 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 it's across the industry. I think that every big institution is going to have that when, when advisors become outliers, I think it, it's a problem. I mean, you have a, an interesting point in framing to it that, look, anyone in the firm can potentially deal with this, but if you end out being an outlier, if, if your practice doesn't look as much like the typical firm in whatever environment you're in, you're going to whack into this bar, you're going to whack into this small wall a lot more. And and like, and like that's when, it makes sense to me, it's like, that, that's when the frustration starts to starts to build up. So you make the decision that we've got to, we got to make a change. Mm -hmm. So I guess just like kick off that process. Like how does that actually work? I mean, yeah. who, who do you, who do you call yeah. first to say like, we have $3 billion and we're thinking about leaving. Shh, yeah. don't tell anyone. Yeah, I know, I know. Well, so remember, I have 30 advisors now. 50% of the assets have always been the four partners, you know, so- Half the book was always secure because it was the four of us, but the other 50% is, you know, 25 other producers. So the first thing you've got to do is you've got to herd the cats, right? You've got to get everybody on the same page and you've got to take a poll and say, okay, guys, this is what we think we want to do. Are you with us? Or are you not with us? Because maybe you are 3 billion or maybe you're not 3 billion, right? You don't really know. Now we brought all, but I want to say two advisors with us, one small advisor and one actually there was one major disappointment out of the process, you know, but whatever, it's fine. And he's done very well staying. And obviously we've done fine leaving, but that was the first thing we had to do. Then we had to learn, we had to figure out. So we hired two key hires and we brought over our, our current COO. And I would say that without him, this would have been a disaster because we didn't even know what we didn't know. And it's a complicated process. And I talk to advisors all the time because I, I want to bring them into my firm and I'll talk to a $200 million advisor or a $300 million advisor. And, you know, they're ready to get out and they want to build their own. You know, they want autonomy and they want, and I'm like, no, 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 no. Trust me, you do not want autonomy. You do not want to do this on your own because the reality is, is that maybe they're a little bit younger and maybe they have a little more, you know, confidence than, you know, than maybe I ever had. But, but the reality is they just don't know what they don't know. It is a very, very complicated process and there's a lot going on and there's a lot to build. And so my advice always is try to, and it might sound self-serving, but, and it doesn't have to be my firm, but try to bolt on, you know, to an independent firm that has already done all that because you do not want to spend, you know, the first two years in a transition, just, you know, figuring out and getting all your processes set up and then spending time managing that process. So again, scale, like I think of a practice that's big enough to be independent, really like the size we were. I even look at these billion dollar firms, they want to create their own deal. And I just think that is not efficient. You know, you need more scale today. This business got way too complicated. But so we, we got everybody lined up and then we started to talk to institutions and we talked to Pershing and Schwab and Fidelity. And ultimately we, we landed as with LPL as our broker dealer because they had this interesting hybrid model where you could have other custodians because we wanted to be multi-custodial. You know, we wanted to have more than one custodian. We wanted to have the flexibility. And today we, you know, we have five custodians on our platform and we'll probably soon be six. And so that was something that was important and LPL, you know, made that relatively easy for us. 
Because I was I was going to ask like you had mentioned earlier being with LPL like why yeah why LPL I mean yeah. nothing negative so I'm just there's yeah yeah no, a, a bajillion and, broker dealers plus sure. I'm sure a lot of yeah. RA custodians who are happy to to you know to ask for your business directly so yeah no like, doubt why yeah. why LPL yeah when I mean everybody it was, was knocking on your door yeah and I would say that it was really the hybrid model that they were offering because Custy was Schwab and Fidelity as well they made it pretty flexible for us to do that so that was really the the determining factor. Because we did, we had all the major institutions here, and I and it actually turned out to be a, a good choice for us. You know, we had some growing pains, and you know, I, I don't want to say misunderstandings, but you know, I mean, again, you know, we didn't know, we didn't know, and um, and and the world changes and evolves, but it's actually turned out to be you know a really good situation. You know, w- what we use them for, and and I don't mean to be disrespectful, but they're a vendor for us. You know, that's all all these uh, firms are. They're just vendors. You know, we represent our clients and it's our job to get the best deal, the best pricing, you know, the maximum flexibility, the best execution for our clients. And whichever of these institutions can do that, you know, are the institutions that get, you know, their share of the business. And so to us, to me, it's not really that big of a deal. Like I don't go to LPL meetings. You know, I, I don't really know anyone at LPL, but, you know, they're a- well, So you know, how, how does it work for just who, who you're affiliated with in a point of contact and structure. I mean, just, you guys are a really large yeah. firm. Well, yeah. So, I mean, uh, my COO, when when, L, when we have a problem with the LPL, that's, you know, my COO's job or, you know, my, the guys that run our trading or, you know, the guys that, you know, run that, those activities, it's their job to have some counterpart. You know, when my marketing guy's got to get a letter approved, you know, he's got a counterpart at LPL, but I literally have no contact. You know, and you know, my partners had no contact because there's no reason to have contact. You know, we have great professionals that work for us and help us run the firm, and that's their space. They know it better than we do. But yeah, so that's kind of how we view this. So we don't, you know, we don't feel any tremendous connection, you know, to any of these institutions. I'm not sure they feel any connection to their advisors either, quite frankly. And so the LPL structure, the hybrid appeal, it sounds like was was specifically like the the BD side of the hybrid, they could still handle and transition accounts or investments that were on the on the BD side while also still giving you the openness you wanted on the RIA side to to be able to work with the custodians or multiple custodians as yeah, you wanted. Exactly because because remember too since we're coming out of this insurance uh, company BD a lot of people had 529 plans or they might have had legacy brokerage assets and you know and, and for some people it, it was enough money to matter. So we had to have a BD that we could you know continue to uh, let the advisors collect those revenues. Like for me personally I don't have any brokerage revenue. You know all my 529s were with Schwab, you know fee, you know no fee. I don't charge a fee. But, you know, we have to be attractive enough to join and we had to be able to take care of the people that we already had. And so it gave us the flexibility where we could, you know, sort of be RA only or, you know, you could have that BD hybrid. And so that that was really the decision. And it was good. It was a good decision. It's a good position to be in. You know, it's nice to have the flexibility. You know, so we're not we're not what they call a corporate, you know, uh, LPL group. You know, we're on the RAA side. And so what are the custodial platforms that you're using now? Yep. So we Schwab manages quite a bit of money, you know, uh, for us on their on their platform. We have Pershing, Fidelity T D is on our platform. So those are, you know, in, in LPL, those are our, you know, the, the the platforms, you know, those are the custodians that we're working with currently. And and then you said you're looking at adding a sixth? Yeah, we're at, yeah we're looking at adding uh, another custodian that might give us more capacity on the alternative side, you know, and I, and we'll probably add more of the ultimately because the bigger we are, we bring people in from other places, you know, it makes it easier for them to to move businesses, and if there's something that another custodian can offer us that these that our current custodians don't, then you know we're interested in in having that conversation. I guess I'm I'm curious, like what what makes alternatives like a new platform play or institution play that makes you interested in looking at a at a? Why well, I was going to say a switch, I guess not a switch, but an addition. Yeah, it, it would be an addition. I mean, it's it's really client demand. You know, as as clients demand certain things, higher net worth clients have expectations about certain things. You just want to make sure that you can continue to continue to move up the ladder. As far as you know, who your average client is, and you and and some institutions are are going to be better suited, you know, to offer solutions to those you know ultra high net, let's say, uh, clients opposed to just high net worth clients. 
So tell us a little bit more about just this transition. I, I think the, the words you used earlier were scary and uh, painful. Yeah. So, you know, we, we, because we, we were always a, a high activity kind of roll up your sleeves, working class group of people, you know, we had lots of clients, you know, um, it wasn't like I had a hundred, you know, uh, clients with, you know, average file was 2 million bucks. That wasn't what my practice looked like. And so we had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, you know, thousands of clients that we had to move. Now, Northwestern was very gracious when we made our, our move. So we had some time. It wasn't like we, you know, made the call on Monday and the doors were locked on Tuesday. We controlled our space and we actually negotiated a deal on the way out, you know, so they were great, you know. Really? Uh, yes. Yeah, we sure did. Again, so- yeah. So can I ask, like, I mean, how does that, how does that work? I mean, well, like, what, I mean what, do you, what do you negotiate? Or just like, what do they not well, negotiate? There, well, I mean, look, there were certain things that they would rather have seen not happen. And there were, right. there were certain, well, you know, Presumably fun- like, you know, Northwestern insurance, I'm sure they were hoping to see the insurance policies well, not be, you know, yeah, not they, be moved and replaced. Yeah. I mean, they, they wanted everybody to, to be respectful you know, of, of quality products that were sold and of clients. And, and we just needed some flexibility. And so they were great, you know, and, uh, and we were, you know, we honored, you know, uh, our commitments as well. And, you know, and look, I still have a few friends there, not a lot. Cause you know, when you, when you're not there, it's the weirdest thing was I, w- I was gone a year and it was my whole adult life. And it was like, I was never there. It was kind of the strange, that was the one thing. And I don't know, maybe other people would, would say the same and maybe that's just life. But I mean, th- you had said before, like, how did you come to this decision? And remember, there's four partners. My, one of my partners, my brother would have gone 10 years earlier. I mean, he was, you know, he was out of there 10 years before, before I agreed to go out. But, you know, so there were all these conversations. But I, one of the things that was so hard for me was culturally, I just felt it was such a part of my, just my cultural life. You know, my, you know, these are people that I've been associated with and that I know so well. And, and I've, you know, spent so much time on the training side. And, um, but it was kind of weird. And I guess that's just the way life is, right? You know, your life kind of moves on. And, you know, in a year later, it's like, wow, it's almost like a very, very distant memory. So, but no regrets, you know, great institution, great culture, learned from some wonderful people, you know, and I, I would do it all the same. You know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have changed anything. And, uh, I guess just what was it like when you had to break the news to to Northwestern? Yeah, I mean, it was hard because, you know, there were certain things that we needed. And I think they honestly tried, you know, to make it happen. And we didn't ask for money. It wasn't like, hey, we want money. It was just flexibility. And ultimately, they made a decision. And I don't know who made them, but they made a decision that it just wasn't in their best interest. You know, and again, most likely everything that we wanted to do has probably been done because, you know, the business evolves. I mean, they have to evolve. So once we got to that point, Point, you know, we had sort of agreed that if we can't come to an agreement that, you know, let's just, let's be nice about it. You know, we'll be nice. You guys be nice. Let's not hurt anybody. It's been a great relationship. You guys were awesome. We're awesome. And let's be friends. And they were great. You know, they really were. They, you know, uh, they honored, you know, every commitment they made. They, you know, they did not make it difficult. The process was hard just because it's an o- onerous process. And, and, and again, we were, again, I've always been lucky. I'll, I say, I know how lucky I am. And I, told myself 800 times a day how lucky I am. But we were very lucky because, you know, the people that were in charge at the time, you know, were very reasonable, you know, professional people. And, you know, I think everybody honestly tried to make it work and it just didn't, you know, and it was fine. It was a little bit of a round, you know, a round, I guess, peg in a square hole. And, and that's fine. That's nobody's fault. And so uh, we were able to kind of work our way out in a, a really nice uh, way uh, from a time frame standpoint. So we didn't have the problem that most advisors have, you know, where, you know, you, you tell your manager on Friday and you're locked out and people start calling your clients on Monday. You know, we did not have that experience. So that was very fortunate for us. So help me understand just the, the journey since you said it was, it was about 3 billion that you were transitioning out with in 2015. I know you're, you're like coming up on or just past 9 billion now, which is a extraordinary leap, leap in relatively few years. So like, just how has this played out in yeah. the roughly seven years since? We were 30 advisors and now we're probably 54. So we've added some advisors, good markets, right? So the markets have been really good. I mean, it's been seven years. So when we caught probably four great you know, years in the market, 
everybody here really grows their business. This is not a place where, you know, people are just, you know, they have their hundred million, they hold on, they add a few clients a year. That is not the kind of operation that we have here. People are, everybody knows what their collection uh, goals are. Everybody tracks their numbers. You know, the numbers really grow here substantially. You know, our expectation is we'll add a billion dollars of, of assets a year on the advisory side as far as acquisition or bringing on new advisors, and that we should probably grow half of that just in client collection, you know, and then if the markets are good, we'll do better. But like my personal goal, you know, I'm a hundred million dollars of fresh net assets a year. My number is probably the biggest in the firm, but there's lots of people at 20 and 40 and 50 and, you know, a year of fresh collected assets. So, you know, everybody wants to grow their business. You know, no one's just hanging around. You know, everybody's got really good growth targets. Interesting. And so, so help us understand just the way the structure works today. Like, how does it work if an advisor wants to affiliate with the firm between sure. like what what they get, what the firm gets? Sure. You've got cost to cover. Yeah, yeah, LPLs yeah. presumably needs to get a little little bit of piece of things for what they do. So just like how does how does the structure work? So we have a grid like you know any I guess institution would, but you know it, the the numbers are are high. You know again because we don't run this thing you know as a profit motive. I would say that, you know, the average advisor that we bring in that's, you know, 150, 250 million or more in assets, you know, they're looking at a payout of around 90%. You know, they cover their own staff costs. They We give them an opportunity to plug into our think tanks. So there's real leverage, you know, on the employee side. We handle HR and benefits and, you know, and lots of other services. And then my people take care of everything for them, all the software purchasing you know, we, we we negotiate all the deals with all the vendors, including the custodians. So we have great, you know, pricing with all these institutions. And my people are there to help them with any problem they have to so that they're not spending time, you know, worrying about the logistics of their business. They're just out there looking for money. So my advisors don't spend any time operationally. They pick up a phone and say, hey, this isn't working. Would somebody come down here and take care of this? So again, it's really plug and play. And all the things that they think they want to build, we probably have already built it. Because I think of the problem that most advisors make when they go independent is they let it be an ego decision where they want it to be about their name. You know, the Bleakley Financial Group, my name used to be in the, in the name of the firm. When we left the uh, Northwestern, we were, I want to say, Bleakley, Schwartz, Cooney, and Finney, which are the names of the partners. One of the things we decided, because some of the other advisors, you know, well, what about my name? I said, we're going to make this really easy. Gary Bleakley left us 25 years ago. We're just going to call it the Bleakley Financial Group. And then that way- <laughs> So you <laughs> deliberately went with the one partner exactly. who's not there. Exactly. That's the name on the door. Hasn't, hasn't been here for decades. And the reality is because, you know, it isn't about ego. I don't care if my name on the door. It's not about that. It's silly. And so that's really not the point. So I try to tell these advisors when I'm, when I'm trying to recruit them, just try to be careful about that. Don't make this about, you know, about your ego because it's not, a, it's not about ego. You know, your, your golf handicap can be about your ego. This is business. So make smart business decisions. Spend your time and energy on the things you're really good at and spend your time and energy on the things that are important, which is taking care of your clients, buttoning down your, your clients and collecting money, you know, growing that business. And let professionals that understand, and that's not me, that's the people that work for us, let them handle those, those, uh, you know, those tasks much, much smarter leverage, leverage. So help me understand just is how you explain this affiliation structure to an advisor is because I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hearing this, like you've got to cover your own staffing costs, but bleakly gets 10%. But then there is all this stuff that we actually do do for you separate from your your staff costs. So just help us understand further, like how do you position, I guess, for the end advisor who's thinking about yeah. affiliating with the firm? Like what you know, like what what are you guys doing for the 10% that I'm I'm contributing in? Like how well, does that I'm, well the first thing we do is we get their financial information and we just match it up. So almost never are they not net net better with us and they are where they are almost never. So that's not really ever an issue. And then we just go through our decks and we, sh we show them all the services. Just where do the cost savings usually come from that yeah, like for example, you go through their P&L and, yeah, and find yeah. the savings? Yeah. So like where they, where they, they might have their, if they have insurance practices, they might have their own insurance underwriter. Well, we have an underwriting team, so they plug in. So for a third of what they were spending or less, they have underwriting. I have a, a, a woman who runs our 401k qualified plans department. Now, I don't know what people do. I'm guessing, unfortunately, people just don't do this at all because- 
it's so complicated with compliance, but we have somebody that makes sure that every plan's compliant. She handles all trustee reviews. She bids out all plans. You know, she makes sure that all of these updates and everything that needs to be done is done. And you don't even have to be on the trustee call. You know, all you've got to do is make sure the education is being handled at the uh, client level, which you should do anyway, because that's an opportunity probably to pick up some clients. And that costs like it's de minimis, you know, where we're not even taking a percentage of the cases. You know, we don't work that way. You know, if you're making $50,000 a year on a case and she services for you, it costs you 3500 bucks. If you're only making $10,000, it'll cost you like $1,500 and you don't have to worry about it. And so if somebody has a robust 401k practice, I assume they're paying, you know, this is a, a $150,000 a year person. So I assume that that's kind of what they have to pay. You know, on the investment side and on the planning side, you know, we have what we call think tanks. So they're like pods. And so for 75,000, 100 grand a year, you plug into a pod, they take over all your takeover proposals, all your review proposals and all your trading. So again, depending on, you know, and, and, and by the way, the work is probably much, much better than most of the people, you know, that we bring on. And so, so there it's discounted, you know, there's leverage and there, and the, and the work is better. And so, and then my guys are always out there trying to find better solutions, you know, whether it be cheaper solutions or, you know, we don't index, you know, the S and P, you know, we separately manage account with tax loss harvesting the S and P and, and then the alpha is in tax loss harvesting. And so, you know, that's something we didn't do obviously at our old institution, but something we do today because the guys that run my investment committee and the guys that are our investment leaders, they're the guys that are, are responsible to find those things. And so that I don't have 50 advisors or 54 advisors running around looking for 54 different solutions. Those solutions are all created for them. And so, I mean, it's not really a problem. You know, we, you know, once we get in front of people, it isn't really a problem, you know, to, you know, to, to sell that, you know, and, 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 and I'm always perplexed when they don't join us, you know, I, I just shake my head, like, you know, I'm not sure what they're thinking, but, and we lay it out, you know, it's very simple, you know, it's, the numbers are right there. So it's, it's not hard to, to do the math. And then just as an advisor, like how does the, it's just like, how's the client base and ownership structure work? Sure. Like are you uh, are you an outsourced or a sub-advisor for me? Am I actually being an IAR and your RIA? And then like, what happens if I want to leave? Like, how, how does that work? So they're under our umbrella. They're, they can, if they want to leave, they can leave. You know, we're not, they're not contractually obligated. We're not buying their practices. So, you know, they are running their own P&L. We are in the process of creating a capital formation currently where every advisor will have an opportunity to roll in at, for equity in the firm because we really want everybody, you know, to have equity to, so that if someday something happens, you know, we want everybody to benefit from that. Um, and that's, that's one of our goals for 2022. I don't think I own anybody's clients and no one owns mine. So the idea that somebody leaves a firm and the, and the manager has everybody in the office calling that individual's clients, to me, I just find that to be disgraceful, right? Because maybe it didn't work out. Maybe that advisor doesn't want to be with you anymore, but I don't think you should be trying to take their clients. I don't, we don't believe that those are clients that are our clients. Those are my advisor's clients and, and we're advisors. So maybe that's why we look at it that way. So I respect that. And so it's my job as a partner here, and it's my partner's job to make them want to be here. And if they don't want to be here, they shouldn't be here and it shouldn't cost you anything to leave, I don't think. So that's sort of how we look at it, you know, and, and maybe a private equity firm might say, we don't like that. You know, you've got to lock these people up tighter, but you know, that's not, that's not our, 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 our sort of our focus. You know, our focus is create a place where everybody wants to be here. And if somebody doesn't want to be here, I don't want them here because it's just not, it's not good energy. You know, it's, it's not good for the firm. It's not good for the culture. And I get, you know, phone calls. I've got an awesome advisor in Denver. And for the first year or so, about every other Friday, he would call me to say thank you. And maybe for the first three years. And I would say, you know, you, I, I love you and I'm so happy to hear from you, but you don't have to do that. Like, it's my pleasure. You know, that's our job, you know? And so we just, you know, we want to help these people grow their businesses and we want them to want to be here. And if we can't do that, then shame on us and they shouldn't be here. So I was struck as well that you you kind of made the point of like you you eat your own cooking as it were like you're you're still an advisor you're still have your own clients in fact I think you said your 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 new asset goals are actually higher than anyone else's in the in the firm so I I, I guess I'm, I'm just trying to understand or visualize like how do you balance yeah <laughs> ma like managing the firm and 
you know, $9 billion and a whole lot of people and a non-trivial size client base Oh, and business development to go get to go get new clients. Like just what does this look like from an, a management yeah, well, perspective to run the firm? Yep. So it is one, I have four awesome partners. So it's not my firm. That's, that's really important. But I have a fantastic management team. So we have 15 or 16 professionals now that all run their group, their, you know, their, 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 their lane. And they are not only are they smart and hardworking, but they are really committed to what we're doing. I mean, we are so fortunate to have hired the people that we've hired over the last four or five years. It's been really a blessing. So what, what we have to do is we have to give direction. So we were onboarding a client or a, a, an advisor last week, and there was a little bit of a wrinkle. And the guys were working on a solution and I was off, but I'm never off. Last Friday, I was in Florida. So I get a text message from the advisor we on board because I'm really on uh, hands on with these people. And he's uh, having some anxiety. Get on the phone with my team. Because the great thing about not understanding how anything works is you can think outside the box, right? So if you don't understand- I, right? I don't know how all this system stuff works. I'm just yeah, going to ask for exactly. the thing that seems like it would be a good idea and exactly. y'all can tell me why that won't exactly. work. Exactly. So I'm like the five-year-old that just asked the most obvious question. So I just said, why don't we just do this? And the guy said, yeah, I think we can do that. And I said, great. So you guys make your phone calls or you have to make your phone calls too. I'm going to call this guy back um, and then and let's get this done. And then they get it done. And so what we, we, so we do have to be plugged in and connected and they, they need our help sometimes, but they, but they're great. So it's not as though I'm not the brains behind this because it's not my skill set. And so what I try to do is lead. I try to lead by example. You know, I try to I help, you know, my advisors call all the time. I've got this situation with this client. I'm having this problem. What would you do? And, you know, because I've done this for 38 years and, you know, and thank goodness I wasn't smart enough to be a doctor or a lawyer or an engineer. Engineer, you know, this is, I guess, what I was really built to do. So I, I just, you know, I'm pretty good at that. And so I spend a fair amount of time, you know, uh, with that, you know, with these people. And, you know, when we have partners meetings uh, every week, uh, my individual uh, sort of responsibility, if you will, in the firm is I am responsible for recruiting with our full-time recruiter. And so he's really the recruiter, but I get really involved. So I have lots of conversations and, and meetings. And, and so that's my, like my brother Scott's in charge of, you know, human resource. And, you know, one of my partners in charge of technology, the other partners in charge of the investment service. Services. So everybody has that person that runs that, that that group reporting to them. So we're not creating anything, but, but we're just sort of supervising, if you will. So it's a big organization. There's a lot going on. Sometimes I want to pull my hair out. Sometimes, you know, it's a little frustrating for sure. You know, I don't have a lot of time that I don't have anything to do. Uh, you know, I, I don't even know what I would do. If I only had to run my $2 billion of assets and that's all I had to do now, I don't know what I would do with myself. I mean, I think I'd be bored because, you know, I, I just don't know, you know, because if I have an hour in the middle of the day, I'm doing a video. I mean, I try to put out a video every week uh, into the market, you know, so there's lots of things I'm doing and I don't know what I would do with myself if I wasn't sort of what my brother likes to make fun of me because only he can, you know, I'm the face of the firm. And every time I walk into a meeting and I was five minutes late yesterday and he goes, oh, now can we get started? Because the face of the firm just got here, right? I'm like, okay. yeah. I'm going to kill you. But anyway, so, yep. So a, a lot of help, big organization, great team, and we're growing it, you know, and we're going to, we're going to continue to grow this great team that we have. So I guess just, can you paint the picture for me? Like, how does this, well, like, what does this org chart yeah. look like? Yep. At the top of the chart, uh, I've got my COO. So he's really, and then I have my chief compliance officer. He's a lawyer. And so, and, and, and he ran a BD. So very smart. So I would I would say that you know Paul at the top sort of is 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 managing the business, and then below him you've got somebody that runs HR, somebody that runs marketing, somebody you know obviously compliance. We have somebody that runs the technology. You know we have you know um, onboarding and and you know the person that you know deals with all the custodians, you know all the transactional stuff, not the trading but the actual contracting and and you know all of that. So we have someone that runs that department. I've got a great, you know, uh, guy that runs our trading. I have a wonderful uh, young lady who is in charge of all the commission, you know, all the or the fees rather, you know. So she deals with all the custodians. I have, you know, a, a CFO in house who deals with all the finances and you know and all the money. It's obviously outside accounting as well. 
I've got my my life coach who tucks in under HR. And so all of these people, you know, I've got my my guy that runs recruiting. So, and all these people basically try to stay in their lanes. You know, we, we have a management meeting, you know, uh, I, I want to say they have two management meetings a week. I, I try to be in as many of those as I can, but I can't be in all of them, certainly. But I think it, for them, it's important, you know, that somebody is in there, you know, that we're, you know, that they know that we're interested, you know, and that we're trying to help. But yeah, so it's a, it's a group effort, you know, um, we pay everybody well and, you know, and we really feel like these guys are, you know, building this thing with us. And if there's ever, you know, a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, you know, then, you know, they will be well provided for because they've earned it, you know, and, and everybody knows that. So structurally, like everybody kind of feeds up to the one, like all these different departments of HR and marketing and tech and recruiting and onboarding and the relation, because still the relationships, like all of that funnels up to the COO as like the the one person that handles the the day to day management of the organization and the COO reports to you or you and your fellow partners exactly yeah we, we the, he'll report to to us in a partners meeting every uh, we invite in every department head comes in for a partners meeting to report you know sometimes there's nothing going on sometimes there's a lot going on and then each partner is sort of responsible for their lane as well. And so they should be aware of anything that we're working through in that area. So if they're if we're negotiating some kind of a contract or if we're having a problem with technology, that partner should be aware, well versed in, in handling that with those people. And and so how do you divvy up the lanes amongst the partners? Yeah. So what we did is we just kind of divided up what we thought the the things that had to be, and then we just tried to, you know, to to, to pick the best partner to be best suited for. And the recruiting was a natural for me, you know, so that was something that it's probably the busiest, but, and, and for our growth, it's probably the most important, but it's just something that probably made the most sense for me to do. So that's how I got that. And then what are the other lanes? Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, someone's in charge of investment. So we have investment committee. So Jack's job is to, you know, he's in charge of sort of the investment structures. Uh, if we're bringing on new investment ideas, making sure investment committee runs properly. Are there any problems with any, you know, assets on the, uh, on the platforms that we have? Again, he has people that will vet all that out, but he's ultimately responsible for that. You know, uh, somebody else is responsible for technology. Somebody else is responsible, you know, for what we would, I guess, client services, you know, is, is would be the best word for that, which is the people that are making sure that everything is operating properly, you know, between the clients, you know, the accounts, the custodians, you know, somebody else. And, and again, in my responsibility, I spend a lot of time with Vince Niemauer, who is our recruiter, constantly where are we? Who are we talking to? What are our issues? You know, what are our, you know, what do we need to do? Schedule, you know, who are we onboarding next month? We don't want to, we always want onboarding to be really well done because it's stressful enough for people. And so we want to make sure we spread everything out properly. So that's something I spend a lot of time with. So the, these sort of partner lanes, like the, the people in those areas don't report up to the partner because they report to the COO, but the partner's kind of in, in there helping to make calls or, or yeah. make yeah, decisions they're... or kind of just set vision and strategy of what's going on in that area. Yeah. And then what happens is we invite these people to partners meetings to do report. So again, if there's nothing on their agenda, they might not be on, you know, they might even come to the meeting. But if we've got something going on, you know, with our trading, Kyle is going to be in the meeting and he's going to report on that. You know, if we're having a, an issue as far as compliance or documents or whatever we're doing, then, you know, Richard Zach, who would always be in the meeting anyway, but, you know, he, he has a report, you know, within that meeting. So, you know, there's a brief report for each department, assuming they have something to share. And that's in every partner meeting. And how often do those partner meetings happen? Yeah. So we have like, a, there's a there's an official, you know, two hour part, partner meeting every other week. And then I typically will meet with my recruiter, my COO, and my chief compliance officer. We try to get together every Monday for like an hour at four o'clock, you know, just to, you know, what's going on this week? Is there anything, you know, that's happening? You know, just so I feel like I've got a good you know, sense of what's happening. Because the, the thing about great people is they don't like to bother us, you know? And yeah. so, you know, and, and that's, that's, I really respect and, and appreciate that. But at the same time, I don't like surprises. So I tell them, look, guys, if you're having a problem, just come tell me. Like, I, I want to know early. I don't want to find out late, you know, because that's just too stressful for me. And so I figure if I can have an hour long conversation, ask a bunch of questions, they'll tell me what's going on. Then I feel comfortable that I've got a good handle on what's going on. So what surprised you the most about this journey of building an advisory business? Boy, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, I, 
You know, I, I think um, I think the success that we've had. You know, look again. I, I think of myself. You know, I, I grew up so differently. Went to a very modest, you know, state school in New Jersey. You know, have lived a relatively, you know, simple life. I mean, I've always had big expectations, but to have a business that has a value that we think that this business has, you know, collectively. And, you know, and like you say to somebody, yeah, we have 9 billion of assets and, you know, they're like, oh my God, holy, how's that possible? You know, or, I mean, I guess I'm, I'm just surprised, you know, at where we, where we've landed, you know, so that's probably, you know, we've earned it. I'm proud of it. We didn't buy it. We don't buy clients. We haven't bought businesses. I mean, everything has been basically built, you know, one brick at a time. And again, I'm not sure if that makes us smart or not smart, but but that's the way we've done it. And and I guess, you know, sometimes I'm a little surprised, you know, at, you know, some of the pushback that we get, you know, when you run a business, you know, particularly from advisors, it's sometimes I'm a little surprised, sometimes a little disappointing, you know, but I guess it's like children. I mean, I don't know, Michael, I assume you have children. I have three children. And it seems like the people that we love the most and that we take the most care of sometimes you know, give us, you know, you know, the, the most trouble. So, you know, I have not that they're children and I, you know, they might listen to this, but, but sometimes, you know, when you have 54 children, sometimes every now and then you're a little surprised, you know, at some of the pushback you get when you're trying to help people. But I would say, but, but really it's been just a great, great journey. I mean, the, the surprise of the, the life that I lead, the life that this business has afforded me, the people that I, I get to work for, my clients, you know, it's just been incredible. So I would say, you know, I never imagined, you know, that life could be like this, that you could be in a business where you actually can help people be paid as well as we're paid, have the flexibility that we have. It's just amazing. And and I guess the one thing, though, that I've always believed, and, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer, you know, uh, and, and again, I, I work with a coach who's been really helpful for me the last three years because making the transition from just producing to really trying to build a business, you know, bigger than your own has been a challenge. And he's been really, really helpful. And, you know, I, I, I a lot of stuff I read, you know, uh, one of my favorite uh, books that I've read, you know, recently, you know, and I don't know whether you uh, have ever read Dispenser or not. It could be a great guy uh, to have on a podcast, you know, Joe Dispenza, but, you know, he reads a book, he wrote a book called You Are the Placebo. And it's just this whole idea of our thought processes. And that if we really believe that we can do something, and if we really focus on that, we can actually change, physically change, you know, our, our makeup, you know, our, our brain, you know, makeup. And, and, and what we can accomplish is really anything we, we really think we can accomplish. And, you know, Chuck is a big, you know, believer in all of this, uh, you know, uh, all the science, you know, the neuroscience that they're doing today. And as it relates to success and our business, and it's just incredible. And so as I've worked with him, you know, uh, he's turned me on to, you know, all of this. So tell me more about the, like the coaching relationship. Yeah, yeah. So if you just, who, yes, who yeah. did you hire? Why did you yeah. go find them? This is kind of a interesting story. We don't tell people this before, uh, before they're on board. So the coach is, I'm actually married to the coach. So the, the coach was, and it's my second marriage and she wasn't uh, our coach before I married her, before I met her. She went back to school several years ago and she got, you know, certified as a coach and she was in a private practice. And I convinced my partners to let her kind of hang out, you know, a couple of days a week and do work and I would pay her, you know, so she wasn't on the firm's payroll. And a year later, you know, she's in every partner's meeting. Nobody wants to make a decision without her in, in the room. And I'm looking around like, it's kind of annoying because, you know, when you live with her, you know, <laughs> It's like, come on, really? Like I, I say something and they say, they look at her and say, what do you think? I'm like, I'm going to, you know, I, I, I <laughs> I'm going to hear about this yeah, later. I don't think I can tolerate this. Right. And then she's really created this whole, you know, program and it's great because she loves it. Everyone loves her. I just have so much better of an understanding of even what's going on in my organization. Not that she'll share confidential, but she'll just, you know, point things out to me that the way we're operating or things we need to pay attention to. So she's a little bit like Wendy on billions, I would say is probably you know, a pretty good description, only she'll actually talk to clients as well. And so the guys have, you know, uh, farmed her out to, to lots and lots of clients. And that's been really helpful. Now, she's not my coach, you know, because naturally, since I'm married to her, I don't listen to her, right? At least I don't let her know I listen to her, you know. <laughs> but anyway, although I do listen, I just, I just don't let her know that. So does that mean you also have a separate coach you've hired for you individually? I do. Yeah. The way the world is so, you know, circular, right? And how, 
you know, nothing is by accident and, and the universe provides. So I've, I've done a tremendous amount of teaching training, you know, within the system I was in for 30 years. I probably did 100, you know, meetings. I was probably at half the, the, uh, the uh, uh, offices in the country at least once. I mean, it was amazing. And so I would get phone calls from young advisors, you know, hey, my name is Chuck Downs and Chuck is my coach. And he'd say, um, he was like 22 years old, 23 years old. He saw me do a talk at the annual meeting. And would I, could he come and ride with me for two days? So, you know, I, I would go to, to my wife at the time and I would say, hey, um, we got this kid, Chuck, something. He's going to be staying with us for a couple of days because, you know, these kids have no money. It's like, I'm not going to put him up in a hotel. And he would ride with me. You know, they would ride with me for two days and we'd go out on appointments. You know, they just wanted to learn. They wanted to see how you did it, what you said, whatever. And we did that, you know, I did that all the time. And so 28 years later, and Chuck, you know, grew up in the system ended up leaving the system and going to Mass Mutual. And then he ended up creating a coaching business. And he is really amazing. And he has probably had the greatest impact on me from a light, my life standpoint, you know, just from my, you know, managing my, my, my life with my business, you know, my peace. I mean, it's been really a blessing. And the idea that, you know, that this guy kind of came into my life by accident 20 years ago, and now he's my coach. And we started about a year ago, actually, we started a coaching program. And so, which I'm excited about. I don't know where we're going to find the time, but but it's it's it'll be fun. So what's the coaching program called? Yeah. yeah so the, the, the program is Epic Success. And so the, the, the website is epicsuccess.com. And what we do is it's a one-year program. And so what happens is, you know, we do a two-day sort of kickoff. And then what we do is we do a monthly coaching call, you know, and Chuck and I do both. I sort of handle the growth side, you know, the practical side of building the business. And then Chuck handles the life side. But what I would say, though, is they are so intertwined. You know, it's what, what I find is, is that the biggest obstacle for people to be really massively successful. You know, it's it's a confidence thing and the confidence comes from capacity. And and I think it's this consistency thing, you know, that that they that they can sprint for some periods of time and then they stop. And so we're inconsistent. And so what we really try to do is we try to work on those things along with all kinds of, you know, the technical workings of the business and all the things that we've done to build a successful practice. And so yeah, so we'll have our next Session will be September. We'll be in Dallas. We find Dallas is kind of a pretty convenient, you know, location. And yeah, it's central, it, pretty accessible. Lots yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's yep. cheap to get there. And and so um, and we'll be late September. And, and if anyone's interested, epicsuccess.com, you know, on the website there'll be information. If anybody wanted details or dates or you know whatever, we'll include links for it as well. So for, okay. for those who are listening, this is episode 284. So if you go to kitsis.com slash 284, we'll have links out for Epic Success and, and the You Are the Placebo book if you want to check that out as well. So what was the low point for you on this journey? I would say that you know when we were transitioning, it was very, very stressful and difficult. But I would say that the, when you have something that happens, something really bad happens, you, know, you, you lose a client, for example, or you don't make the sale, you know, or you get really, really disappointed. And look, if you're on the insurance side, uh, anyone that's listening on that side, you know, low points are when you work a year on a case and it's a big premium and, and the insurance company declines the case. I mean, that could be really frustrating, oh. you know, but, you know, but sometimes you get out of the blue, you'll get a, someone will call you and they'll, you know, for whatever reason, sometimes it's your fault, sometimes it's not. And, but, w but what I realize is that every time something really bad happens, something that really makes me feel bad, it's really a growth opportunity, right? If I, if I learn from it, you know, and I never learn from my successes. I learn when I embarrass myself, when I, when I do something that, you know, when I say somebody asks me a question and I'm not, I'm too proud to not know the answer. And so I try to, you know, s pretend I know the answer and then I was wrong. And then, you know, and you embarrass yourself or, or, you know, you just don't do a good job with something. And so I would say that, you know, look, it's been, it's been stressful the first 10 years in the business. Um, like many people listening, we didn't have any money. I was probably really in the hole. I always joke. I mean, I, I was probably 10 years to a, a zero net worth that I actually was on time with my taxes, had no credit card debt, didn't know anyone any money other than a mortgage. And I was making well into seven figures at that point. So it's a, it's a process, you know, it's a journey. 
but I would say that it's what makes us better. And and every time, you know, I get that phone call, you know, I kind of look at it as I just made room, you know, for something better. You know, because typically when you get that phone call, it's probably someone you don't want to be working with anyway. Because if anyone would fire you, that means they don't appreciate you. And that means they couldn't have been much fun to work with. And so when I get that occasional call and, and yeah, I get them too. So, you know, it's not just happening to you guys. It happens to me too. But I kind of look at it as I just kind of cleared out. It's like cleaning out your closet a little bit. I just made a little bit of room for a brand new suit or a sweater that I'll actually be able to see, not in a big pile that I can't see. So, but yeah, but but we've been really fortunate. You know, this is, I've our life has been a blessing. We've been associated with great people. We've always managed to find the right people when we needed them. So I, you know, not, not, not a lot of things that I, that I would say that I have any regrets about. What do you know now you wish you could like go back and tell you yeah, 20, yeah. 30 years ago yeah. when you're just, just yeah. still in that ramp up? Yeah. And, that, and, that, and that's a great, you know, that's the question everybody always asks, right? And, and they should ask. I would say that I would call on much more successful, older, wealthier people early, earlier than I did. I would have invested, even though I invested everything I could, I would have borrowed money earlier. To, to, to invest in the business, you know, to be able to bring on, you know, the capacity so I could do that. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I, I think even just the point you made earlier, like it took me 10 years to get to a net worth of zero, even though I was making seven figures, like where was the money going? Well, so, I mean, we probably weren't being as financially responsible as we should. You know, I, I lived in a, you know, we lived in a big house. We live in Northern New Jersey. Taxes are 45%. You know, I mean, it was, I don't, you know, I mean, and we started in a deep hole because I started right out of college. I had no money. So I was basically borrowing money. I had to buy into the firm. So, you know, there was just lots of, you know, lots of things going on. And, you know, and, and the businesses, uh, when you're in the insurance business, even though, you know, you're making money, but it's so inconsistent, you know, it's not, it's not like the businesses today. And again, you know, I don't know, it, I'm going to sound, if you're listening to me from Iowa, you're going to sound like this guy's an idiot, but you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 a month, you have three kids, you're in Northern New Jersey. It's not like it's a huge amount of money. You know, it's not hard to, you know, to spend that, you know, kind of money and catching up. And, and, you know, the people are always buying their taxes because what you don't realize when you're 22 years old and someone gives you a check for like $10,000, that only about, 60% of that's yours, right? That somebody else owns the other 40. Well, you know, you, you, you get a year into the business and, you know, you're already behind, you know, 50, 60,000 dollars in taxes. And, you know, so it's just kind of the normal stuff. You know, I mean, I hope that's normal stuff. Maybe I was just terribly irresponsible, but, but, you know, so yeah, so it definitely took a while before I felt comfortable, you know, that financially, you know, I had some liquidity. I didn't know anyone any money. You know, I was, I was in good shape. It took me a while. Yeah. So if you're out there and you're, and you're having that, it's not a problem. You know, we, we used to always say, that poor is a state of mind, right? Being broke is just a temporary, you know, situation. So, you know, nobody's poor. We're not poor. We were just temporarily broke, right? With a solution to get out of that situation. And so anybody feeling that way, just keep that in mind, you know, that, you know, if you work hard, you're in the right space. You're in a space where, you know, this is an unlimited opportunity for everyone that really wants to do what they need to do for sure. You know, and I believe that for everybody. It's just amazing. We're all very fortunate to be where we are. So what advice would you give for younger, newer advisors getting started today yeah. in the business? Yeah, I would say, look, it, it's always safer to build a practice via volume. So I think that the mistake a lot of young people make is they're looking, they're elephant hunting. And I think that the one really smart thing I did is I built a really big base. So I think if 23 years old or 24 years old, that I'm better served going out and, and, and getting clients that are professionals, good futures, good people, smart people, responsible people that I can grow with, opposed to trying to chase you know, the big sexy, because my odds of getting those are going to be very small based on you know, my experience and my circumstances. And I don't want to be beholden, be beholden to a few clients. It's very stressful. So if I, like for me, I can't lose a file that really matters. I mean, it would be pain, you know, I, I would hate it. I'm competitive. I don't like to lose a file, but I can't lose a file that would ever matter. And I, I don't want to be in a situation. So I think that the bigger you can build that, that base. And also when you think about it, if you have hundreds of people that, that they think that you're their advisor, then that means there's hundreds of people running around the world that can refer you, you know, that say, oh yeah, I need somebody. Oh, my advisor is Andy Schwartz. You should give him a call. I had two of those today. And so the more the bigger our, our base, the more people we have, I think the safer we are. I would just 
be a little bit more particular about the people I brought on, I think, but I would still do it in a, in a, in a big numbers way, you know, in a, in a broad, you know, activity, lots of clients. I like the idea of lots of clients because then I can, because then I can just hire advisors to work with me to take care of those clients. And that's what I do today. I have a couple of advisors that help me with those clients, you know, so, so I think that, I think the mistake that some advisors make, especially that they're really smart and sophisticated and talented, you know, they, they only want to work with certain people and they want to be with the movers and the shakers. And, you know, and I just think that I would just be careful with that. So given that you would still build a, a, a bigger, broader client base, but you said you, you do wish you were a little more particular in who you brought on. So like, who, who would you be screening out? Yeah, in the, I mean, in the early days, if you're still generally pushing towards volume, yeah, I think that you, you what you want to do is definitely screen out older clients with small accounts because you because you have to care for those accounts. And the problem is, is that you wake up one day, like we have a, a great young guy here, and he's really doing well now, but he would bring on lots and lots and lots and lots of small accounts. And I kept saying, you don't do that because you're, you're they're gonna they're gonna overwhelm you. It's not profitable, and you're creating a problem. And then he finally figured. And, he and they're not, and they're not necessarily going to grow with you because no. there's a big difference between no. uh, you know a, a smaller account of someone in their 30s who's going to be saving exactly. for 30 years, and exactly. someone with a smaller account in their 70s who's just going to be drawing that down. Exactly. So if you're exactly years. you're a 35, you're a 30 year old part or a partner or associate in a big law firm with a big future, it's fine that it's a small account because there's lots of things that can happen there. They can refer you. They're going to grow. You're going to do lots of things with them. But a 65 year old with 200 thousand dollars in an IRA rollover, I mean, I love them and I hope they find somebody to work with them, but it can't be, it can't be me because that, that is not going to be a, a, a good, a good file to have in my system because someone's got to care for that and we have to pay to, to do that. So it's just not, it's not, we can't charge them enough to make that profitable. So I would just, just be mindful of what you bring on. And, and also our personalities are, we always want to win, right? We want to win. We, it makes us feel good, right? We got to win. We got a sale. We got a client. Just be, be smart about it. Ask yourself, is that a client that will be a profitable client and a client that I'll, I'll be glad to have in the future? You know, and if it is, then great. And, and it doesn't mean you have to make a lot of money today, but if they're not making money today, they've got to have you know, the prospects going forward, you know, they've got to have good potential. And so just, you know, bring on as many people as you can that have really good potential. And if you can mix in a couple of big accounts along the way, that obviously is helpful. So as we wrap up, this is a, a podcast about success. And, and just one of the themes always comes up is the, the word success means very different things to different people. And so as someone who's built, you know, a very sizable, you know, not nine billion dollar business from the advisory perspective, how do you define success for yourself at this point? I mean, for me, one being happy, you know, I, I have a very happy life, um, you know, peaceful, you know, having people that uh, you can help. You know, the greatest thing about, you know, making money and and if, if the firm ever, if there's ever a transaction and someday there probably will be, although it'll be a long time for now and, you know, and, and, and the default position is just build the greatest firm in Northern New Jersey, you know, with the most resources and, and the best services. But, you know, someday being able to really reward the people that work with me, being able to pay the people that, I, that are on my team what I pay them, which we pay them really well, like that to me is, you know, that's the best part of, you know, success is sharing it, you know, being able to help my family and other people. And then, and also just, you know, having advisors that are out there in the world that, you know, call you from time to time and just like say, hey, I really appreciate, you know, everything you've done for me. And I'm like, well, I didn't do anything. You know, we've had a few conversations, you know, maybe I helped you with, with a couple of thoughts, but, um, but being able to have an impact, you know, um, because there's just leverage in that, you know, it's like not so hard to be able to figure out a way to make yourself money and, and have a couple of houses and, and live a nice life. But if, if you can translate that and you can have other people out there that can also improve their lives. And that to me is really a blessing. And for me, that's, that's been, you know, a lot of fun. And the thing about success is you have to be materially successful or financially successful before people will listen to you. And, and maybe that's unfortunate, but that's just the way things are, right? And so the greatest thing about posting your numbers and people saying, wow, aren't you a big advisor? It's not about the numbers. It's not even so much about the money, although I, I wouldn't do it for free, but it's really more about that you have the credibility than that you can actually make an impact. And so I think that's probably to me the most, you know, the most important thing about being successful is that you can really do something with that because when you're perceived to be successful, people will then listen to you and then you can actually help people because they're actually listening. So I think that's the part that I enjoy the most, you know, is that I do have an opportunity to have an impact. 
Well, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much, Andy, for joining us on the Financial Advisor Success Podcast. My pleasure. Glad to finally uh, have a chance to, to talk with you. Likewise. Thank you. Want even more ideas, tools, and resources on how to break through to the next level of success as a financial advisor? Check out the leading financial planning industry blog, Nerd's Eye View, at www.kitsis.com, where Michael covers the latest practice management trends and financial planning strategies. And by joining the members section, you can earn IMCA and CFP continuing education credits, along with exclusive member content. Get it all now at www.kitsis.com.